Welcome to Behind the Muscle Podcast. Today's guest is an NPC classic physique athlete. Today's guest is Alex Padrone. Alex, welcome to the podcast. Hey, how's it going? Thank you for having me. For, for sure, man. I, I apologize. I can't pronounce uh, your last name like you do, man, but uh, I, I did the best that I could. And No, you did good. You did good. Awesome, man. I'm, I'm super, uh, super excited to have you on. Alex, I know uh, you, uh, you have quite the story that I'm, I'm really uh, looking forward to kind of digging into. Uh, before we kind of get into your story, uh, who are a few of your favorite bodybuilders of all time? all time if we're picking three i would have to go with kevin lerone sergio oliva jr i'm mean, sorry senior and flex i have to i have to say flex flex lewis okay why uh why kevin lerone first kevin lerone he's i feel for me he's just very he's a freak like he can diet he, he'll prep for a show and then when he's done prepping for a show, he's done. Like, he just, you know, he still works out and everything, but, like, he can come off and relax and enjoy life. And then when he needs to prep, he's back on it again. So that's, like, how I like to, like, do my prep, you know, be on and then relax, enjoy time, and then get back on prep. Very cool. Very cool. The second question I'd like to ask all my guests, at what age did you start lifting weights? And then why did you start lifting weights at that age? Uh, I would have to say... What, how old are you when you're in eighth grade? Like 12, 13? Yeah, like eighth right. grade. Um, uh, my dad had bought a bench and some plates and he put it, you know, that living room where nobody goes in, but you, you, you just, it's there. For whatever reason, he put the bench in that living room and I would start using it, but I was never really serious until I got to high school. I was always like the skinny kid and I weighed, I think my freshman year, I weighed like 135. And I had like acne, I had braces, I had glasses. And not like the cool glasses that everybody has these days. It was just like dorky glasses. And yeah, skinny kid with all that just didn't work out. And I got picked on a lot. So then I just started working out, doing the wrestling team, football, baseball. And then from there, just got better over time. Very cool. So eighth grade. Awesome, man. So um, I, I like to use that uh, last question just to kind of transition into uh, my guest backstory. So um, just talk about where you grew up. Um, talk about kind of your fa family dynamics. Talk about, you know, some of the, the ups and the downs of childhood up to about high school, and then we'll move on from there, Alex. Yeah, um, so I was born in Cuba. I came at the age of three. Um, been here ever since, Vegas pretty much, and then I moved to, to New York for a little bit for six months in 2015, and then came, went to California for a year and a half, and then came back to Vegas, and then been in Vegas since 2017 and so forth. Um, growing up, uh, my parents were always together, so it was a family, very family-oriented. Um, my siblings, my brother and sister. Uh, my dad worked all the time, so he worked like two, three jobs at a time. So the only days I did see him was Sunday, Mondays, and then pretty much saw my mom the most. So I had a, a more bigger relationship with my mom than I did with my dad at the time. And through high school, through middle school, I was I was doing baseball for years. Got into wrestling, so then I was in wrestling practice, baseball practice, and then football. So now I had all three sports, and I was constantly busy, but. Uh, like I said, my dad was working all the time. So my mom, he was either at the games or dropped me off at the games or practices. So then it was really kind of me at the time. Uh, when I graduated high school, uh, I got more serious into lifting. So I was really um, focused on competing. So I started competing. My first show was Men's Physique in 2012, 2013. It was the Seed Car Classic. Ended up losing to my best friend now, Jordani Kraja. He took the overall. Uh, but... Uh, yeah, I got really serious after high school. And at that time, that's when my parents got divorced. And I kind of took it like anybody else kind of kind of take it as it's their fault, especially being like 18, 19. I'm like, oh, man, it's my fault. That it up. And from there, I kind of used that as a drive to be kind of rebellious, but like also very focused on just lifting and trying to take my anger out there. Um, from there on. I did a lot of moving. So like I said, I worked out, uh, I moved to New York for six months. So I was there for, from 2015, uh, October, November, to about the end of, uh, to 2016, February. And then I moved to California and didn't work out for a year. I didn't work out all 2016. I moved to California, didn't know anybody other than my girlfriend when I, when I moved over there for her. And yeah, I didn't work out at all for a year. I didn't start working out till 
I went to the LA Fit Expo in 2017 in January and I was out of shape. I saw my friends, John Skywalker and all them. And I'm like, damn, this is not the body I'm used to. And I started lifting again, moved back to Vegas, focused on myself. My girl focused on herself. Uh, started working the nightlife. So I was always working at XS and Encore Beach Club and everything. So I, start, I started getting shredded and everything and then transitioned to that nightlife where you're just working 24 seven. And then, you know, you got introduced to alcohol, uh, being with your clients all the time, no sleep, you sleep like two, three hours, maybe if that. And then quarantine happened. Quarantine got like, it affected everybody differently, you know? Like I try to stay positive to it, but like with our own personal issues that we all kind of go through, um, it, it lets us like, we all let it affect us in a certain way. And for me, since I was already used to drinking all the time because of work, um, I just kind of took it overboard. And then from April of 2020 to about August of 2020, what I drank in that period of time, I'll just say it like I woke up, had a bottle, finished it, kept going on throughout the day, had another bottle, it was just constant. And come August, I went out to dinner, had a little sip of something, like a little sip of a drink. And instantly I was like, oh, don't feel good. Got the sweats, was sweating. And I would go home, I would lay down and I would just instantly have to get in the shower because I just didn't feel good. I never went to the doctor to check it out, but I probably did get alcohol poisoning. I was pretty much addicted. I couldn't like not, not drink. So that's really hard to talk about, but you know, we all faced through it. And then uh, come the new year, I started going back into the gym and I started working at the, at the Dragons there and kind of got my mind back to how I used to be when I was younger and started competing and training. And I met Justin Flex, everybody. Justin Dees is my coach and he helped me through my prep and got me back to how I am now and got me back on stage. So I didn't compete for eight years. Eight years ago was my last show from this past uh, July, so. All right, so before we kind of get uh, deep into some stuff, I wanna, I wanna go back to the childhood a little bit. Um, so you came over from uh, Cuba, uh, I'm assuming, you know, your family just wanted to, uh, to have a better life and everything like that for themselves and their kids. Uh, what was that like uh, being an immigrant um, growing up? Did you kind of know that you were different or were you around a lot of uh, Cubans in America? What, what did that look like uh, for you, Alex? Um, it's, it's crazy because I still remember a lot before I came over here. Um, so it's not that anything's different, it's more so adjusting and then some people explaining that you didn't come here on the boat. Like being Cuban, everyone's like, oh, you came here on the boat, you're illegal. I'm like, no. Oh, so you slam. I'm like, no. Um, everything was legal. You know, we had paperwork. Uh, at the time, it was uh, 19, 1999, 1998, um, they did like a lottery. So they offered uh, people to apply for this. And if you win the lottery, you'd get your uh, immigration papers and stuff. Uh, so my parents won that. And then we had family that was already, already living in Nevada or Las Vegas, whatever. And um, pretty much helped us transition from over there to over here, been here since. And then growing up, being bilingual, I mean, so the way the school system works is when you're bilingual, they instantly put you in a ASL, so as a assisted like learning or whatever. And uh, especially ESL, like it's uh, English second language. And so you're not, not that you're not smart, but they pretty much, even if you're, if you came here at two years old, three years old, the fact that you came from somewhere else and you know it's a second language, they're gonna put you there just to like test you until you like completely test out. And I was never the best test or so. Uh, I was in that until like seventh grade. I'm like, this sucks. I'm like, everybody's fresh off the boat. And I'm over here like, I've been here for a while. Pretty much raised here, so. But no, I mean, I think the main thing that we did and this is how I see it. A lot, a lot of, uh, and I love my people like to, to death. But uh, in Miami, a lot of Cubans stick within their Cuban uh, goop. So they're accustomed to the same lifestyle that they had back home here. Uh, there's a lot of Cubans in Vegas, which is crazy uh, to think of, but we didn't, I wasn't really surrounded by that community often. Like we had our families and we had our friends that were Cubans, so but I wasn't like constantly um, impacted by that. I was more you know, getting to know America and how anybody else wants to like progress and get further in life. Very cool. So you mentioned earlier, uh, during our first uh, couple of uh, questions that um, you grew up pretty skinny. 
Um, what, what was that uh, mentally like for you? Did that, did that uh, bug you? Did you get made fun of? Um, just, just share a little bit about that, please. Oh, most definitely. I mean, so me being Cuban, like I have a lot of like black features because on my, dad, my dad's side, like they're really African and everything. So like my lips were like huge uh, when I was a kid. So like I was a skinny kid, big head, huge lips. And it's like, it just didn't proportion. Like I grew into them. I still think they're a little big, but uh, I was too big. Like my, my head was too big, but my head was too small to my lips. It was just bad. So I was constantly getting picked up on my lips. I was super skinny. So like, not that I was anorexic or anything, but I just didn't have any muscle or anything on me. And then acne braces and glasses. So elementary school, you don't really get it. You know, it's fine. Middle school is a hit or miss, but you know, you, you never see, really saw the blues until you get to high school. And what really triggered me lifting and trying to be better was my freshman year. Uh, I remember I was in PE, it was like fifth period. And I had a beanie on because it was like in wintertime, whatever, we had a beanie on. And our P classes of our freshmen mixed with the seniors and juniors and sophomores. And the senior kid grabs my beanie and just starts tossing it back and forth. Now I'm playing monkey in the middle with them. And I went, when I went to grab it, I slapped the guy in the face and led to a fight. So magically, I ended up winning, which was cool. But, you know, I, I felt like, man, I'm constantly getting picked on. And at that time, uh, that's when like that, it was like before disease movement started going, but I was really into like how people like were like super shredded. They had the abs constantly showing, not too big, but you know, it was like, cool. Like, let me get the abs. So I got, I worked so hard on my abs. I was like abs every day. Boom, boom. And then I was like, oh, let me get my chest up. And then from there I was like, okay, you know what? I'm gonna do this for me, see where it goes. And then at the time bodybuilding.com, uh, you can create a profile. So you got like this profile you created on. I don't know if you remember that, but. Oh yeah, I I, yeah. I, I did it too. Yep, yep. Yeah, you created a profile. You made friends with people on there. You asked all types of questions. You shared your pictures. You know, it was the coolest thing back then. And it's like, you learned so much. That's when I learned about, uh, like, especially in 2011, 2012, uh, when Steve Cook, 2010, around there, when Steve Cook had won his, uh, his shows and then he went into like going to bot like men's physique and everything like that so i was like i was a big steve cook fan back then too and yeah from there i was like man he has a perfect body like if i look like this by senior year this is gonna be sick you know like and then he was really big on like the big man on campus so i was like well, okay like let me get this body like i need to look like this and you know at first it started me looking like this to impress people and then it went from me looking like this because I like how I feel and look. And it's crazy. Like I wasn't like the biggest kid my senior year. I was probably 155, if that. So I went from 135 to 155 my senior year. And I think, yeah, 155, people are like, oh, you're on steroids. And I'm like, dude, no. <laughs> like It's like the moment you start getting muscle, everybody thinks that you're taking something and looking crazy. And yeah, it was just... I got picked on, that's the one thing. And then when I got picked on, it's not that I didn't like it, it's more so like what made me different from you. And then the moment I changed myself, that's when people started looking at me differently. And then I love this. And then that's when I started focusing myself and I didn't worry about what people thought. Um, one other thing I wanna ask you about Alex, cause it's pretty commonplace, uh, unfortunately nowadays in our society, but you said your parents got divorced and. And it sounds like you kind of took that hard that that kind of like maybe it was something that you did because you were kind of acting out or or misbehaving. But um, would you would you just share a little bit more in depth about uh, kind of just psychologically how that affected you? And uh, do you think it still affects you to this day as obviously an adult? Um, I would say affecting you wise to, to the adult before we get into the story. Um, it took me a long time. It took me. They got divorced in 20. 14. Um, so it took me, uh, I'll honestly say 2020, like to really understand and process how I was feeling. Um, kind of going back to how everything started, like in 2014, I was dating this girl. My parents were dating. Me and her were having issues. Secretly, my parents were having issues. And I got a text from my my brother or my sister, I don't know who, who texted me. I just remember either my, my sibling texted me or my, or my girlfriend at the time texted me. I was like, hey, your, your parents are getting divorced. And I was, I was just leaving work and I was like, what? So like that, like my heart sank. 
I didn't know what to think. I was like yelling. I, I was yelling at my mom on the phone. Um, I reacted very heavily. I reacted to my girlfriend. I was like, don't talk to me. Like, I don't even want to talk to you right now. I want to get my, like, the, I know, all I know is I was leaving work, got to the house. I was telling my siblings, my siblings were crying. I was telling my siblings, get in the car, get in the car. Like, we're leaving. Like, I was just pissed. And they never got in the car. That's what, <laughs> that's the one thing. But I ended up, like, going up on a drive. And it took me on a roller coaster. That, that triggered what I would say would be, like, my, my black years, where it led me on a route that... You know, nobody wants to take, you know, like the drugs and drinking. And I, and I, was, I wasn't even 21 at the time. So drinking at, at 18, I think I was 19, 18, 19. I was, I was just going ham. I was going drinking this. Thoughts were there, you know, like my suicidal thoughts were there. And it took a lot to overcome that. I was just, I was always thinking, but never acted on it. So there's a, there's a difference when people act on it. And then when people are, the thought is there, but they just can't get that mental clarity, you know. And thankfully I had a, uh, a good friend that she helped me through that that part and then i ended up uh living with my dad and then that's when my my dad and i had a better relationship my mom and i kind of kind of started drifting apart um so i started living with my dad and we just had a, had a bond it was crazy because we growing up he was always working the only time on the weekend so when i did see him it was just go to the movies and hang out and that was it now i'm seeing him every day we, we interact they were older so we can talk about other stuff. And before I moved to California, like I said, I was in New York for a couple months. And uh, when I went to New York, I was doing solar. Can't they gave me a call? They're like, hey, solar's out of Nevada. You have no work. I'm like, what? Transfer me. So we ended up transferring to California. But kind of the way California went is at the same time in 2014, my girlfriend now, we had met. Uh, I was a lack of man at the time. So we had met. And we got closer really quick. Like we're talking and with everything I was going on, I was like with the divorce and everything, I was like, okay, I'm gonna make a trip. So I made a trip to California, hung out with her for a weekend. We became like bestest friends. I was seeing her like every other month. So I drove to California every other month for like a week, every weekend. And yeah, so that happened December, crazy story. And the whole process is my friends being divorced. Just, I met this chick online, comes from Australia, crazy chick. Anywho. Comes in December for a month just to visit. Ends up staying with me. Bad story. Don't let that ever happen. Let me think of doing that. And the girlfriend I have now saved him from going to Australia. Like I was supposed to like fly because she flew back and she's like, hey, I'm gonna buy you a ticket. I'm like, okay, cool. Didn't fly. And in that process, I was like, okay, you know, like this girl's cool. Like I should probably move to California, hang out with, like be with her. So I ended up moving to California. When I moved to California, my dad stayed in touch like almost every day. Like I, I heard from him every day. And my mom and I had a falling out because there's a conflict with the guy that she was talking to, um, which now they're married and we have a great relationship. But at the time I took that, I'm like, what the, like, what the heck is going on, you know? And she had taken his side about something and we I took it to heart. We didn't talk for like a year, almost a whole year, the whole time I was in California. She reached out on him a couple of times and uh, out of the few times that she did reach out, only like saw her once. It was only for like 10 minutes. She, because she, she came to California multiple times, but that one time was out for 10 minutes and it was like, why? And fast forwarding past that, uh, when I moved back, I tried to have a relationship with my mom and it was still pretty hard. And my dad were cool, but being Hispanic, when I moved back, uh, you know, it's like, okay, you're here for a week, find yourself and you figure it out, you know? So I had to do that, live with my friends. I was homeless twice. So in California, I was homeless for six months. So I found a place, worked, lost that job, worked, moved back to Vegas, lived with my dad for a week or two, found a job, lived with my buddy, lost the job, homeless again, lived with my best friend, Shauna. And she, like her and her family, like to this day, I'm very grateful they took care of me. And that's when I started getting back on my feet when I started living with them and working. So that was like 20, going into 2018. 2018 is when, when I really started going back and being on my feet. Um, I, was, I still have my relationship with my dad. Uh, my mom, not so much, but we still talked here and there. Uh, 2019, uh, I started, like I was still, like I was already in the nightlife at this time. 
So 2019, I started working on Encore and Excess, and it was just there 24 seven. So uh, at that time, my girl had just moved to Vegas. So she was fresh to Vegas. I'm working nightlife. And we already had an issue in our relationship. So that wasn't even helping out being surrounded by girls in the nightclub and day club all the time. It just doesn't really seem like a healthy relationship. And my mom's and I relationship started getting a little better. We ended up going to like the wedding. And you know, we were talking here and there, but it still wasn't um, what it used to be. And I was at this point, I'm more clear. Like I, it was more like clear of like, okay, this is what happened. It wasn't my fault. Now I have to like improve and grow. And it just took a lot to figure out like, why was I upset? Was it something I said, something I did? Was it something they did or they did? Um, and just kind of, kind of figuring it out like, it's not, you don't have control over everything that happens around you. You know, you can only do so much to impact something and if it doesn't give back, like you can't worry about it too much. Don't let the stress overtake you, you know, your um, sanity. And come quarantine, uh, me and my girl split because it was just, it was a rough patch and we we're like, okay, look, we can't do this. We're stuck in the house 24 seven, we're arguing 24 seven. Um, we already had our issues and it was like, okay, let's take a split. So she did her thing, I did my thing. And quarantine hit. So with the split, uh, not working, stuck in the house, all I did was drink. Like I had nothing else to do but to drink 24 seven. And it was, it was like, it was a roller coaster because I, as I looked on social media, I was having a blast. I was just, I was posting everything. So everything's all like, he's having a good time. But in reality, like I'm just, it was just me hiding um, how I truly felt inside. And people like, the hard part about talking about this stuff is that people don't understand that men tend to have this issue. Like this is a big issue and they can't talk about it. Like they'll, they'll sit there and they're like, you know what, I'm gonna hold it, I'm gonna hold it, I'm gonna hold it. And in the previous years of my life, I used to just post my feelings, you know, I was like, oh, this person did this to me, da, 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 post this meme, post that, and it's like, show your feelings. But in 2020, I didn't post anything. Just, just kept it, put up, put a face to look like it was cool, but only when my friend Jordani, uh, like I mentioned, that beat me in uh, 2013, whatever. Uh, <laughs> he was there for me during that time. My friend Sean was there for me. A lot of people were um, that knew of the situations and me constantly drinking 24-7. Um, and the way, like, it's not that they weren't there for me through this drinking, trying to get me to stop drinking, but like the way I was doing it, like they knew what I was going through, but it was like, I didn't show enough for them to truly understand like how deeply hurt I was. And, uh, yeah, it got to me starting talking to this new girl and, uh, she was cool. Great chick. We had fun, we drank, went out, every, like we did everything. And then, uh, you know, it was around my mom's birthday. Uh, we went out and I was always oh, my mom's birthday. I was like, well, you should, uh, she was like, oh, you should get her flowers. I'm like, eh, why? She's like, cause I like, and she's like, give me a whole speech. And I'm like, you know what, you're right. You know, like it's quarantine, you don't know what could happen. Um, that is my mom, it's my, my only mom, you know, and you know, I took her advice, went to my mom's birthday or whatever, uh, grabbed her flowers, said happy birthday, everything. And then since then, like, we went a lot better. But it's more, at this point in time, like, I was already good with it. It was more so I wasn't finished with it. Like, I had, I still had to, like, open that door to be like, okay, let me let them back in. And that's when I let her back in. And August came. I quit talking to another chick. August came, got really sick with drinking, and that was clarity. I was like, okay, look, I, I take a sip, just a little sip, just like that, and instantly messed up. And that's what clicked. I was like, okay, I can't drink anymore. So I don't really drink. If I do drink now, it's like a beer or maybe one drink. But I wasn't drinking from August to about March. So August 2020 to March 2021, I didn't drink. And then I didn't drink all prep. But all right, so um I want to, I want to ask you, uh, what was kind of, uh, I, I know you said you had that a sip of alcohol, then you didn't feel good. And that was, seems to be kind of like a, a turning point for you. Right, Alex. Yeah. Um, how did you begin to get clarity and how did you kind of begin to, uh, pull yourself and dig yourself out of kind of the, the black hole that you, you put yourself in. So you can, this was August of 2020 
talk to myself and the listeners about how you kind of began to take those steps to move in a new direction. Okay. Um, okay, we can go back one month. So July 4th, everybody goes out, goes to party, uh, drinks, etc. Like to the, at that point, I was drinking so much that drinking, I had to finish at least three bottles for me to truly be drunk, you know? And at this party, I drank so much that I was so blacked out that when I saw, and, it, and it's that like, I, it's, when I saw, saw these two people come in, um, I'm a very like, I'm very peaceful. Like when it comes to me, like I don't, I don't have any like aggression towards anybody or anything. But I saw these two people talking and I lost my mind. I was like, why are they talking? And then that's when I got really aggressive. And I don't remember anything. All I remember is me yelling, drinking, and waking up in my bed. And when I woke up the next day, um, I had my, my phone was blown up. I had messages, calls, et cetera. And I asked my roommate, I was like, hey, bud, like, you know, what happened? And I was like, dude, you were blacked out. Like, I tried to stop you. You weren't listening. Like, uh, you drove home. And it was like, it's like, man, like, luckily nobody got hurt. I didn't get hurt, you know, in that process. But uh, that's one thing that really, like, okay, I became really aggressive. So that's one thing. I'm, I'm beyond aggressive. I'm over drinking. And I have no self-control of who I'm talking to and how I'm talking to them. And especially to people I, I care about, friends, family, like, where maybe, like, the fact that I'm expressing that, I was like, that's wrong, you know? And uh, a lot of people were hurt but with the way I acted that night. And I was like, okay, I gotta change that. So kind of quit drinking for like two, three weeks. Uh, and you get into like this relapse, you know, you're like, oh, I need to have a drink. So I would have a drink. And when I did drink, I would get cold sweats and I just wouldn't feel good. I'm like, okay, like I won't drink. So I was like, no, so then the next day I would drink again and I'll get the same thing. So August, um, come August, I had that sip and I was in the middle of dinner. I was just having dinner, had a sip and I was like, man, I can't finish my dinner. So we left, went home and I lay in bed. It was right before bed, I lay in bed and uh, instantly I started sweating like my temperature is going up and I'm like, yo, what's going on? So I hopped in the shower, had like made my throw, uh, myself throw up. And from there I was like, you know what? Like I can't drink. And I didn't want to go to the doctor, f- figure it out my own myself. I was just like, you know what? I just can't drink. And took the time to myself, didn't drink. Um, like I said, from August to about March, my birthday in March. So that's the only time I actually gave myself to drink. And it was one of those things just like, do I want to continue? Even though it's one drink, do I want to continue feeling this way every time I drink? Or just take some time away from it, however hard it may be, and try to feel better. Because at the end, it's like either you, either you do that or you go to the hospital to check yourself out. And I hate it. I mean, I love, I'm okay if I need to go to the hospital, but I'd rather not go to the hospital if I don't need to, you know? And it was one of those things I was just like, man, like, dude, I have a video. I have a video somewhere on my phone where I was, it was five in the morning, you know, just, in jeans, I had just finished two bottles of wine and I will just ride my bicycle around the neighborhood. And I'm like, like, who finishes two bottles of wine and ride, rides a bicycle at six in the morning or five in the morning? You know, like that's, that's not just something that somebody normal does, you know? And I'm looking at these videos and I'm like, it's like, why? Like, why am I doing this, you know? And um, I, I picked up a book, um, Care Package. It's called Care Package. I picked it up on Amazon and a lot of people, when they read books, they're like, okay, they're, they're, they're like, you think the author is giving you a message. Um, but in this book, the way he went about it was he spoke about his own issues. He's like, this is what I went through life. Through, uh, this is how I went about it. And I was like, and I related now. I was like, okay, like he did that. I had that. He had this issue with his parents. I had this issue with my parents. And it was just like a relatable book. And it cleared my head. I was like, okay, you know what? Like, let me be at peace. Let me make peace with what's going on. That's when I started making peace with my mom and my, and my dad. I was divorced. That's when I made peace with, you know, my issues that I had in the past with my, uh, with my girlfriends and stuff and um, the alcohol and everything. I was just like, let me be at peace because if I'm not at peace, then one, I'm not happy for myself. 
I can't make anybody else happy. And then from there, like, where's that gonna leave me in life? I'm not gonna be 16. I won't be successful that way. And yeah, I relaxed. Uh, I was really hoping, you know, like the year started brand new. So didn't even drink for New Year's, didn't even have a drink or anything. Um, started slowly getting back in the gym, but I wasn't consistent. And from there, it led to me working at Dragon's Lair. I applied, got hired, and we started working in February. And then from there, being here, I mean, that put me on a different path. It put me back on the path that I need to be on. So um, one, one kind of final thing I want to ask you about uh, that you kind of brought up a little bit ago, and then we'll kind of get into more of the bodybuilding talk. But I think this is really important, especially for, uh, for us guys. And, um, you know, it's, it's only dudes that mostly listen to podcasts. So I, I think this is something that we all need to hear. But you talked about earlier how us guys kind of have trouble opening up and we kind of hold on to feelings and emotions and issues and all that type of stuff. So um, how, how has that process worked for you um, being a little bit more open, Alex, and, and being willing to share your story and, and just not kind of hold everything uh, tight to the vest, so to speak? Is, is that, has that been a really big part of you um, healing and transforming your life, just being able to, to share your story and, and really let go of some of those feelings and emotions that you've you've held on to for years? Yeah, most definitely. It's like, because I was, I was always, not that I would lie, I mean, I lied a lot, but it was like those white lies that didn't even need to be lies. And I would take it, I wouldn't take it out on anybody. Like I, when I would, always held it to myself, I would take it out on a wall or a windshield or something. Like I have so many scars on my hand because I was just that angry or I just didn't know how to react, you know? And I always kept it to myself and then to the point where I kept it so much inside that I would like go in a closet and just cry in the closet or just keep it there, you know? And times where it was just like, I should shut down. Like I would be smiling, but it's just, I'm shut down inside. And being able to open up how I am now um, has helped me a lot. Just not just career wise, um, not just my everyday life, but my relationship. Um, this is the best me and my girl have been in years. I mean, we started dating in 2016 and we split twice. One for me moving back to Vegas and then uh, so I can do myself and herself and then quarantine, which, you know, we both needed that. We, we've known each other since we were 18. So now being 26, um, we had a lot of growing up to do and a lot of learning. So uh, being able to open up has made everything a lot better. Like I'm, I'm more, I feel like I'm more than honest with my girl, <clears throat> excuse me, and then I need to be sometimes, but she respects that, you know, and uh, I got nothing to hide now. Like, it's like, people are like, oh, like I'm hiding this, I'm hiding that. Like, you learn to that, that the moment you're able to be open with your feelings and how you're feeling within yourself, you're able to pretty much accomplish anything. You're able to be successful with your girl. You're able to have a natural relationship versus, oh, I'm holding my phone and hiding it or keeping it from here because you think she's doing look through it or even start thinking things that she's doing. And, and we all guys have that. Like, oh, you, the moment you get something, you're like, who is that? You know, and then you, you should start thinking that way. And now it's like, I've always been a confident guy, but I still was skeptical. And, I, and I, on top of the reason being skeptical is because, you know, I'm the same thing with my parents. They're married for years and then they split. You know, so now I'm like, okay, but she's going to leave me or whatever. Like, you know, and now be open with everything. Yeah, my relationship is really good with her. Uh, work is really good. So it's not, nothing has stopped me from being open because now when I've been open with people and then they're able to like actually respect me and believe in what I say versus, oh, this is just another guy talking, you know? And guys, hate, like, guys, we, 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 we hire everything. We don't like to, to be open. We, we like to either be open or lie in how we're open we are. Or like, so yeah, no, we're, we're good, you know? And just that, you know, instead of being like, yeah, man, we're great, you know? Like, how you doing? We don't, uh, when we ask how you're doing, we never ask to know how you're feeling. We're just like trying to avoid us having to talk about how our feelings are. And now I actually like care. I was like, yo, how's your day going? Versus, you know, oh, my day is good. And yours, like, it's just, I'm curious. Excellent, man. I appreciate you touching on that. Now, I want to talk about um, uh, you uh, working at the Dragon's Lair. And I want you to talk about, uh, most importantly, just being surrounded by champions 
being surrounded by, uh, you know, the, the champion uh, mindset, you know, that growth mindset. Talk about the community. Talk about how being a part of the Dragon's Lair, not only as an employee, but being able to train there and just, again, being around all the champions and those uh, top performers. Um, how has that helped you in your growth personally? And how has that kind of helped you continue to move forward in your, in your uh, life experience, Alex? Man, it, it's crazy because everybody that comes through here is so different. We have, you have UFC fighters that come in, but pro boxers, uh, Mr. Olympias, uh, Mrs. Olympias, uh, the Raiders come through here, the Chargers come through here. So we have all different pros and from different categories are coming through and people from all over the world like coming here to see that experience, you know, and being here for me at least, and I'm pretty sure it's happened to everybody else, but it keeps me on track. Um, I could I, I could be working anywhere else. And yes, I would go to the gym, but I wouldn't be on track. I feel like being here and surrounded by everybody I'm, I'm surrounded by keeps me motivated because everybody here has a goal. Everybody, not just in business or in the gym, but in life, everybody has a goal here for something. And they're, they're striving for something. They all, they all have the same mindset here. And to be the odd bought up out of that mindset, and then you just, it won't work for you, you know? So uh, you start kind of, when I first, I put it as so the first day training here, it was, uh, I was training arms and Hassan was training arms. And I just go, damn, we just go over here to this corner over here. And, you know, it, it humbles you because you go to, you go to your regular, you know, your local gym uh, and there's a plateau at that local gym. There's, there's a, when you start, you start getting good. Now you're the, you're technically the best looking working out guy at the gym, right? Your, your mind says like, Oh, I'm the best one here. But when you come here, it's like, it humbles you. You see seven time Mr. Olympia, eight time Mr. Olympia, four time Mr. Jay Cutler, Flex Lewis, uh, Brendan Shaw, uh, uh, WWE wrestlers that come here, USC US fighters, Raiders. You see all these guys, and you're like, I'm not the best one here. Like, look at these guys. They're, you know, he, he, he owns the gym. He has a business. He has, he's done this, he's done that. He, he owns this. He's making this amount. He, like, everybody's a different aspect in life. And um, the one thing I always see on social media is like, who you surround yourself with, you know? Um, that's where you're going to stay. That mindset is going to stay, it's going to keep you there. So if you're surrounded by winners and people that are champions, you will eventually become a champion. And if you surround yourself with people that are just like, oh, let me just, you know, they're very small-minded, you can be very small-minded. So it's like being surrounded by everybody that, excuse me, that has that, uh, that champion mindset and are always motivated. I'm just constantly, the energy's there. It's like, there's not a day where I'm not like, all right, I gotta get work, I gotta get this workout in. Or I'm like, oh, not today. Like there's days where I'm like, not today. And I still go, get, go, go back and get my work done. So it's very, it's very motivational. It keeps, it keeps me on track. I love that, man. So you uh, uh, got back on stage earlier this year after I think you said eight years of, of not competing. Um, I would love to hear about that experience. Talk a little bit more about Justin, um, you know, what it's been like uh, working with him. And uh, just talk about that experience and the accomplishment of getting back on stage and kind of the, that whole day and that whole experience, if, if you don't mind. Yeah, um, this, whole, this whole year, um, I started talking about competing again uh, in January to a Callum, Callum Bamo, he's, one, he's my best friend. Like, we're like, this is my dude. And, um, you know, we kind of had a similar, you know, kind of pain, um, him going through what he went through. And then me just going through what I went through, we, we were mentally kind of checked out with a lot of things, you know, and we kind of understood each other. And once he started lifting again, I'm like, oh man, like this dude's looking good. I'm looking like shit. Uh, sorry for the language. And, uh, <clears throat> and then we started talking. I was like, hey man, like he came out, he came out in January, no, February of this year. And we got lift in. And I was like, man, like I really want to compete again. Like, what should I do? He's like, dude, do it, like, just go back on stage. I'm like, okay, like, who should I go, with, like, coach-wise? And um, we talked to a couple, he's, you know, he introduced me to a couple coaches, and I was like, okay, like, I was on the rope, I was on the edge, but I was like, okay, like, maybe hey, we'll do this coach, maybe we'll do this coach, and I kept putting it off, kept putting it off. And I get started working the Dragons there, 
And Su this girl Susie that, that worked with us, uh, she was doing a, a show. She was doing the uh, J. Collier, I believe. And I was like, man, like, I want to do prep. Like, I was already talking about it. I'm going to do a prep. And she does her show. And after her show, I was like, I can get way more diced up than you can. You know, like, blah, blah, blah. So then we, we kind of got, you know, butting heads in a good way. We get being competitive. And she's like, okay, let's do this show. I'm like, okay, done. So then I was like, okay, let me, let me get a coach. Because even though I know where I can get my body by myself, I knew that. I needed a coach. I needed someone to be on top of what I'm doing and how I'm eating and how I'm training because um, it just is easier for me. I, I feel like when I'm by myself and yes, I'll be focused, but I won't have that same drive versus if I'm paying, like when you have a coach and you're paying for it, you know, you know that you have to be accountable. You're, you're not going to just waste money on doing this and then not trying to get results, you know? Um, so Justin being the GM here and everything, um, and he and his experience and being around flex everybody, I was like, yo, um, I want to like, could you coach me for the show? And he coached me for Patriots. We did Patriots July 10th. Um, and we started my prep April 4th. So about 16 weeks, um, from 16 weeks to about 14 weeks, we lost, we started at 16, 16 to 17% body fat. In four weeks, we got down to 12. Uh, another four weeks, we're already in like the single digits. Um, come show day, I don't even know we were ever under three, we're under 4%. And, you know, I started like in that process of prepping. Like I, I remembered uh, when I used to get ready for a show and when I used to just like want to be fit all the time. Uh, and I kind of lost that drive. You know, during working in nightlife and being work, it was just, work, 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 and quarantine, um, I kind of lost that job for the gym. Like, I, I, it's funny because when I uh, interviewed working in my life, I was like, yeah, like a bodybuild. And they're like, you bodybuild? I'm like, yeah. Like, and then now uh, they saw what I was able to do and they're like, wow, you do bodybuild. I'm like, yeah. And uh, it's always been a passion of mine, just being able to be fit and go to the gym and enjoy life um, without having to like, you know, be always looking down here. So like, we always, we always have bar this more. Like I'm, I'm always like, damn, like, something could be bigger, you know, but um, it feels good. Like for me, at least it feels good to be able to look uh, in the mirror and be like, wow, like I don't look bad. It got to a point where I was looking in the mirror and I was like, damn, let me put on a shirt. Like I, I couldn't even walk around my own house in underwear. Like I had to put on a shirt and the shorts because I just wasn't happy with my, with my body. And prepping for that show really got me over the weeks, I was like, man, you, you, you see the difference, you know, when everybody does a prep, um, whether it be lifestyle or for a show, um, you see that, that, that change in their face. They, from day one, they're like this, you know, and then going to four weeks, five weeks, they're, 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 they're you know, they're more lively. They're more like, wow, this is great. And they start feeling like that confidence again. And I wasn't confident like for years, but the past two and a half years, I, I don't, I don't think I was as confident as I put myself out to. And now I'm just like, all right, you know, like I'm, I'm back to being me. I'm my energy's there, and doing that show, it was just like the best experience it was. I did novice and classic, and then did the open. Uh, I took first in novice, and then third in the open. Uh, and now that itch is back. I did uh, five shows in 2012, 2013, uh, 2014 all together, and now it's like, okay, you know, I made a promise. I made a promise to my buddy uh, Jordan. Uh, in 2012, he was like my wrestling partner, and he just won pro in the UFC uh, in 2020. So now I'm just like, damn, I gotta get my pro card. So now I'm back on to uh, keeping my promise that I made to him like years ago, and um, hopefully we can get it done next year. But if not, no rush. You know, bodybuilding is not a sprint; it's, it's definitely a marathon. And um, as long as we do it right, it should come when it comes, God willing. Absolutely, man. I, I love that. So at this point in uh, 2021, Alex, do you have any thoughts of your next competition or is that still kind of up in the air? Um, I have a couple ideas. I know I want to do national shows next year. Um, I, like anybody else that want to do one national show, get that pro card and you know, be done with it. Um, you know, you can't make those promises, but how I'm looking at it, um, you know, everything's at NPC is all amateur level, right? So 
do I, uh, how I'm looking at it right now is like, do I want to go and bring my best amateur body to this national show and win? Or do I want to make my body look like a pro athlete and do an, an, an amateur show and win as a pro bodybuilder, you know? Um, so my goal right now is to make sure my physique is pro level to compete with the amateurs. So that way when I do um, get my pro card, I'm able to go ahead and go against the big dogs in the pro league. And yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm friends with a lot of pros. I mean, I, I know, let's see, Jordani Quadra is a pro. I've known him since 2013, like 2012 was our first show. Um, J, J, JL, um, he just went pro. Jay, I'm friends with Jay Callum. Um, everybody here flex. Um, but it just, you know, and, you know, and this is the thing. It's like when you have a pro card, it's not, for me, it's not like, one, it's keeping the promise that I made. But it's also seeing, once I get that, seeing how far um, I can push the limit. You know, like once you get a pro card, everybody's like, oh, that pro card, this is like, okay, that doesn't matter. You know? Now you're in a different league. Now you guys like, okay, you know, you compete. You're not competing. That drive changes. You know, right now the drive is NPC, win, 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 and you get that pro card. So now what's the drive in pro league? And the pro league for me is just like, am I able to hang with the big dogs? And, that's all it is. I want. I want to have. I want to make this fun. And bodybuilding should be fun. It shouldn't be uh, stressful, you know. That's so, man. so hopefully, uh, April, May, we'll do a show, and then nationals in June, July. Excellent. I love. I love that mindset. There was uh, another guest on the podcast that's a uh, uh, high level amateur out of Canada, and his saying is, "Chase a pro physique, not a pro card." And I. And I. I, I love that, man. I, I think that's great. I think, you know, Nick Walker is a great example of somebody who, you know, uh, you know, earned his IFBB pro card, stepped on a pro stage uh, soon after. I think he got fourth or fifth place. And then we all saw what he did, um, you know, this year. So uh, I think that's a great mindset. Now, um, you know, future wise, in terms of uh, business and career, um, obviously, you know, if, if you do uh, reach that IFBB pro status, that's going to be, you know, probably a, a big boost in terms of, uh, of a career, but do you have like a idea of kind of like what you want to do in the future career wise and business wise? And what, what are you kind of building towards Alex? Yeah. I mean, I'm 26. So it's, it's when I, when, when I think about careers, like before that like you'll go to school, get your bachelor's degrees and whatever you want to get your bachelor's degree in or master's and then that's what life is, you know, and, in today's society, um, that doesn't really matter anymore. So um, for me right now, uh, I do have a, a dog kennel. So I do breed uh, Excel American Bullies. Um, so that right now we have, we're having a litter, hopefully uh, to confirm in the next uh, two weeks. And that should be coming, should be, should be delivering puppies at the start of the new year. So that'll be a good way to start the new year. Um, hopefully we're trying to partner up with the, with the big kennel. So hopefully we can bring that branch to Vegas. Um, so that's one thing that I work on the side on. Um, I'm here obviously 24 um, seven and then just build, build myself. I mean, some now society is just being able to market and build yourself. So unless you, if you're capable of doing that, then you'll be able to succeed and a lot of opportunities open that way. Uh, I believe. Do you, uh, so at uh, the dragon's lair, um, are you doing uh, like coaching and training or are you just staff there? Do you, but do you even outside of the dragons there, do you do any like online coaching or anything or not? Um, I used to um, back in 2014, I used to do online coaching and in-person training. I kind of stepped away from it because my mentality is like for coaching is like, I don't like, I don't like wasting people's money. I don't want people. I don't, I don't really care for their money when it comes to coaching. I love lifting and training. It's a passion of mine. So when I offer those services, I want people to understand that it's like, if you're going to spend X amount, are you can commit or are you just doing this to like pass time? Because it's like, there's people that go out there and get a coach and they get a coach for like two weeks, four weeks, and they get little to no result. And then they go to another coach for another two to four weeks. Now they're like, well, this coach did this, this coach did that. And it's like, I don't want that. I don't want to be that coach. I want to be the coach that you stick a little bit longer, figure out whether you do this correctly and you enjoyed it and you were able to see your results or you saw your results or didn't see your results. And now you just want, like, I want you to be able to do it on your own without having to have me, me be there. Um, so right now I've taken on three clients. It's been a while. 
Uh, this is the first time in years I've taken anybody on, but I took it on three. Um, I helped out uh, Louis De Leon, a good friend of mine. Uh, me, my, myself, Michael, and what's his Zach? I don't know. Uh, us three, we helped him out uh, get ready for this past show with Steve Carr. Um, he looked phenomenal. He did 12 week prep and he went from eating donuts and taking shots to uh, eating chicken and rice and taking protein drinks all day. Oh. <laughs> he, he looked amazing. He, this, this, this is the best I've seen him. And I'm going for a, a good amount of time now. And right now I'm staffed at the, at the uh, Dragon's Zero. So I do all the front services and everything behind, uh, behind the works as well, social media, et cetera. Um, and it's great. I love it here. You know, it's, it's the way this gym is set up, even, even with the staff, the way everything's set up here um, is a family, is a family uh, gym. It's not uh, when you go to your, you know, your corporate gym and you're like, oh, hey, and you just continue walk, walking in and it's instantly your family. Like everybody, once you sign up and you start going here, you're just like, wow, this is where I want to be. And now I know why like, I pay to be here because it's so motivational. It's so, is, is it, aside from the motivation of who's here, just that energy, the moment you walk through the door, just is, we're family. That's all it is. And I love to hear. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't be anywhere else. What's, uh, what's a piece of uh, advice or what is something that you would tell yourself, um, let's say, when you were 18, 19, 20 years old, Alex? Um, something that I've been preaching on social media lately. Um, and it's, uh, be real, um, be, uh, just be real with it, with yourself, with everybody you speak to, um, and don't sell yourself. You know, like a lot of, you know, I realized that a lot of, uh, and I have a lot of influencer friends and, you know, each to their own of what you do on social media, you know, it is what it is. That's how social media is set up to be on these days. Um, but you know, when you're with a brand or something, you know, everybody's like promoting it. <laughs> I'm like here you go, and I'm very I'm very straightforward. If I like something, I'll tell you. If I don't like something, I'll tell you. And and that's that's what makes me me. You know, I'm real. That's something that, like I said, I've learned. I've been open and honest with everybody, and I think that's what people appreciate is being real. Just because you never know. Like you know, you, you you're scrolling through I use Twitter, Facebook, whatever it may be, and you just believe that person because they have 5.7 million followers or they have more followers than you. She's like, okay, well, he said it, she did it, look how they look. They're right, you know? And, you know, a lot of time it's not that way. There's, I'm, I follow people that, you know, have been making body transformations from 400 pounds and now they're 200 pounds or 280 pounds. And, you know, just that, I believe more of that than the chiseled guy that's constantly promoting 20 different products, you know? And yeah, I'd rather, I'd rather see you just be real. There's, there's there's no reason to be, no, everything's filtered these days. It's a filter. Uh, don't stand behind the filter. I mean, I use a lot of filters on, on my face and stuff, but uh, <laughs> um, it's best to be real. Don't, don't filter yourself and just be straightforward. It may hurt some feelings, it may not, but those people that you're straightforward to will appreciate that more than the person that you had to like put a face for. 100%, man. Are there, uh, just through your, your daily uh, life, are there um, non-negotiables or are there um, kind of like parts of, of uh, your daily routine that, that you, you have to do just to kind of continue to move yourself forward or not? Um, right now I wake up, I'm up at 3.30. I'm here to open up the gym I, uh, and then I finish around noon and then start training. If I have anybody I, I, I want to help or friends that want to train with me. Um, we'll, we'll train together and stuff. And then I'm pretty much here till about three every day. So from four from four a.m. to three p.m. I'm usually here. Um, from there, I'll go to my emails. And I'm constantly, you know, looking at my Coinbase. I'm looking at my dogs. You know, and like, how can I promote? I love I love social media marketing. That's like the best thing because that's how you like how that's how life works right now. You know, I got to be on social media. It sucks a lot. And um, yeah, I mean. Yeah, my day is just busy. I'm trying to figure out what can I do next to progress the next day. You know, like I don't want to be held behind. And I'm always on the move. Like I have to be constantly doing something. Or if I'm not doing something, there's something wrong. Like right now, I have like a, a client, a friend that's coming in to train with me. So we're going to be lifting a little bit or so. 
Very cool, man. So um, we're gonna we're gonna kind of just uh, wrap things up here, Alex. Uh, do you have any uh, final thoughts or final words that you would like to leave myself and the listeners? Um, so, so be real, don't be fake, be open, uh, smile, man. I think the best thing I've ever done, and it's something I get told every day because I'm just constantly doing, and it's just a habit, it's just smiling. Um, it doesn't hurt to smile. It, it doesn't, even if you, you know, you feel like you're, you're hurting, um, just smile. Um, even if you, like, it just, you smile at someone else, they're going to smile back at you no matter what it is. And then even though you may be hurting that smile that it did back to you, it's going to make you feel better. And yeah, just stay positive. Just smile. Even, even when the hard times, just positive smile and just keep that smile going. Excellent, man. I, uh, want to thank you, Alex, for being real on Behind the Muscle podcast. This is um, what I get a lot of enjoyment out of is bringing people on, uh, whether they're an NPC athlete, whether they're an IFBB pro, whether they're a top coach. Um, it's, it's just fun to bring on a variety of athletes and coaches uh, to get behind the muscle, kind of hear your guys' backstory and story and, and just hear um, what you've been through because we, we, we're all human beings, right? We all you know, tie our shoes the same. We all put on our shirts and socks uh, the same. We're all walking through this crazy life together. So um, I appreciate you being real. I appreciate you opening up and sharing your story with us. Um, if people want to connect with you, if people want to find you out there in Vegas, if people want to follow along your um, bodybuilding um, experiences, where can people find you? Where can people follow you? Where can people connect with you? Yeah, uh, I'm always on IG, always connecting with everybody. Uh, it'll be uh, stronger by the second, uh, stronger without the E. Um, people think it's like the second amendment. I go by it, whatever. Uh, but stronger by the second. Um, I'm always, uh, always active. I reply to, I tend to reply to everybody. Um, unless you're like sending me a weird DM or something. But, uh, other than that, I mean, I think that's the best place to connect with me. I mean, whatever you need in Vegas, whether it be at the gym or the nightlife, I'm still very connected with the nightlife. So if you guys ever need anything in town, just let me know. Very cool, man. Alex, thank you so much. No problem. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome, my man. Those of you uh, tuning in through YouTube, those of you listening on your favorite podcast platform, I just want to say thank you to you because if it wasn't for you, the podcast wouldn't exist. Uh, the podcast is growing. The YouTube channel is growing. The Instagram is growing. And uh, I just want to say thank you to all of you uh, listening to the podcast. Those of you viewing through YouTube. Three things I would ask of you. If you haven't done so already, make sure you hit that subscribe button on YouTube. That's important because I release all of these episodes first on YouTube, and then I shoot them out to all the other podcast platforms. Um, one other thing, um, if you are on YouTube right now, why don't you go in the comment section and just leave uh, for Alex and myself to see your favorite part of Alex's story, or maybe your favorite takeaway from what Alex shared with all of us today. And then finally, Take this episode, share it on all of your social media platforms, especially on Instagram, tag Alex, tag behind the muscle so that we know you listened and you found great value in this episode specifically. And then finally, I will leave you all with this. Remember, behind the muscle, there's always a story. We'll catch you guys later.